Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Ross Upshur. I'm not uh, Dr. Sonali Kachar, and it's my, I'm a professor at the uh, University of Toronto, and it's my really uh, uh, great pleasure, privilege, and honor to be uh, chairing this uh, Epidemics and Ep Ethics uh, webinar. Uh, the topic today is Ethical Considerations in Alternative COVID-19 Vaccine Strategies delayed second doses, mixing vaccines, and partial doses. As everyone who is on the uh, call will know uh, that many health systems are facing with critical shortages of uh, vaccine supply, and health systems are uh, desperate to uh, find ways to use these scarce resources to achieve the best outcomes possible. So without further ado, I'll turn to introducing our uh, esteemed panelists, and thank you to them for taking time out of their busy schedules to be with us today. Uh, we have with us uh, today Dr. Raji Tajuddin, who's the head of the Division of Public Health Institutes and Research at the Africa CDC in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Ethiopia. We have Professor uh, Jonathan Wolf, who is the Alfred Landiker Professor of Values and Public Policy at the Blavatnik School of Governance at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom. And Cassandra Opakaku uh, Wajunta, who is the Director of the Indigenous Peoples Health Research Center, First Nations University of Canada uh, in Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, welcome to all, and I will, uh, without further ado, hand it over to Ravi, uh, Raji. Pardon me. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, let me first and foremost thank the organizers of this very uh, important um, meeting, which um, for us at um, Africa CDC is quite um, timely. And uh, as you all know, there's been a lot of issues as far as our rolling out of this um, COVID-19 um, vaccine is um, concerned. So to kick off my uh, discussion, I will first of all like to discuss generally what is the current uh, COVID-19 vaccination situation and um, with um, emphasis on um, Africa. I think um, for today, we all know that the access to COVID-19 vaccine is supposed to be like a wartime effort whereby everybody needs to bring their, 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 their strength, comparative advantage to bearing. So in short, it's supposed to be a collective um, effort, but that does not seem to be the case um, today. We know that millions of doses of these vaccines have been produced so far. And uh, most of these doses, you all agree with me, has gone to the 16% of the richest uh, I mean, um, countries in the world, meaning that uh, for most of the countries in low and middle income uh, part of the world, we are still um, scrambling to see what is it that uh, we are going to get out of this um, vaccine. And um, at this rate, we know that uh, quite a lot of the developed um, countries before the end of 2021, we'll be able to achieve the so-called population level immunity or herd immunity. And if we continue at these rates, uh, for us in Africa, especially, we know that uh, the projection is that we may not attain that herd immunity until late into 2023. And all these are some of the ethical issues that I really, really what I'm considering. Again, if you look at um, the, the development of most of these vaccines, they were actually mainly I repeat, mainly financed by public funds. But unfortunately, the making and the distribution of this vaccine has been then left entirely up to market forces to determine how do you produce this vaccine, who gets what, when, you know. Vaccine nationalism has also kicked in and uh, the examples are all there for us to see. Not until recently when African Union through the head of state, um, the, the, the African head of state and government has to launch what we call partnership to accelerate COVID-19 vaccine manufacturing on the continent. There was no worldwide joint up effort to expand COVID-19 vaccine production. Of course, um, there has been a lot of call for suspension of patent, intellectual property rights, trip waiver, and so on and so forth. This was the kind of global effort that allowed the world to come together to eliminate smallpox. The same effort was deployed to eliminate polio. But so far, this has been blocked by rich nations, despite repeated attempts to talk to w, I mean the WTO or even make WTO to see the reason why some of these patent protection need to be suspended, especially given the fact that we are in the middle of a pandemic. So a system where a company that holds the patent on a drug can monopolize its production, even in a global emergency or pandemic, 
I think uh, distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me that this is completely ethically wrong. So in this regard, Africa CDC continue to call for licensing or compulsory licensing that will allow countries in the global south, especially the low and middle income countries to have equitable and timely access to COVID-19 vaccine through uh, production. So let me shift there and um, look at the, 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 to focus specifically on the, on the issue on the table today, which is um, looking at alternative COVID-19 vaccination strategies and what are the ethical issues in there. So let me start with uh, making changes to the recommended dosing interval of any authorized COVID-19 vaccine. I think for me, the key question or the key consideration here is, what is the science and data behind it? Meaning that whatever decision, whatever policy change that we're going to put in place should be backed by science and data. We know that most of the emergency use authorization that has been issued actually specify the dose and the dosing um, interval based on science and evidence from the phase three um, clinical trial um, results. Of course, this is ethically right. But what we are seeing today is that uh, we are in a situation whereby we begin to see a lot of variants emerging, and this has been driving the pandemic, where we are seeing that a lot of our facilities are getting uh, overwhelmed. So the key question here is, what is the implication of sticking to what has been approved or authorized by our different regulatory agencies? And what is the implication of not sticking to that? Today, we have a different um, opinion from ethical perspective. We have opinion that is saying, let's see what will allow us to immunize as many people as possible, so as to convert certain um, level of protection that will take us a step closer to add immunity, meaning that um, we should try as much as possible to space, to space out um, the, the, the first and the second dose as appropriate. The other issue at stake here is that um, we know that uh, for some of these uh, vaccines, like for instance, the AstraZeneca um, COVID-19 vaccine, the phase three trial clearly demonstrated that we can actually space out the second dose or we can delay the second dose up to 12 weeks and the efficacy will still be preserved. So for that, there is no question about it. Now for Moderna and Pfizer, the phase three trial gaps were 28 and 21 days respectively. So therefore, we do not have any empirical evidence to support the spacing out of or the delaying of the second dose beyond the four weeks that, was, um, that, 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 that came out of the phase three um, clinical um, trial. However, if we go back and unpack the phase three um, clinical trial of these two um, vaccines, that's Moderna and, uh, and the Pfizer um, COVID-19 vaccine, you will see that after the first dose of um, um, the, 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 the Pfizer vaccine, the efficacy was around uh, 52%. Uh, for Moderna, I think it was uh, quite, quite much, much higher than that. So what is not clear is for how long should we delay the second dose? But given that the WHO has stated that any vaccine or uh, efficacy of 50% and above is acceptable. So, there should be some sort of sufficient protection that will allow for delayed second dose, at least up to six weeks of um, the, 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 the first um, shot. Anything beyond that lack any evidence. And therefore, Africa CDC, we continue to emphasize that whatever we are going to do, there should be sufficient um, data to back that up. And there should be very, very robust evidence to support um, delaying um, the, 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 the second dose. Now, talking of mixing the COVID-19 vaccine and the use of partial um, doses, for now, these remain questions to be considered in the context of clinical trials, because as of today, we do not have any evidence, any data or science to back mixing of different um, COVID-19 um, vaccines or administration of uh, partial um, doses. So for us at Africa CDC, we continue to support the fact that if you receive the first dose of AstraZeneca vaccine, your second shot should also be AstraZeneca. If the first shot is Pfizer, the second dose should also be Pfizer. 
until we have that uh, sufficient um, evidence and data to allow us to mix COVID-19 um, vaccine. On the issue of partial doses, Africa CDC does not support that either because um, we do not know for how long, what will be the depth of protection, that's number one, and what will be the duration of protection when you use partial arm doses. So in the absence of any robust um, evidence or data, I think the use of partial doses as far as the COVID-19 vaccine is concerned is just um, academic um, exercise. Uh, we also know that there has been called to postpone the second shot for people who have been previously uh, infected uh, with COVID-19 vaccine. Again, this is an attempt to make sure that uh, we are able to quickly ramp up COVID-19 vaccine to cover as many of our populace as possible so that we are um, as close as possible to the um, herd, um, immunity. So again, um, this is something that is still uh, under consideration as we begin to unpack the data that is coming from um, from um, reinfection, uh, because we know that um, usually when people get infected, uh, they tend to have some sort of um, immunity. But for how long that will last, we don't know. So this still remains a discussion um, on the table for us to, to ponder on, whether to delay the vaccine for people who have been infected so that uh, we can give a um, um, chance to people who have not been infected but at risk of um, COVID-19 um, 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 infection. So um, to conclude, I uh, would like to say that in as much as we want to do everything possible to get more vaccine to the public faster, making sure such changes that are not supported by adequate science and robust data may ultimately be counterproductive to public health, and this will undermine the unprecedented vaccination effort to protect the population from COVID-19. So I would like to stop there and then hand over back to you, um, the chair. Over. Thank you, Raji. So I'll turn now to uh, Professor Wolf. Thank you so much, Ross, and uh, thank you to the organizers for including me and to uh, Raji for a very powerful presentation. So let me explain a little bit about the background to the work that uh, I, with others, including Ross and Sonali, who would have been chairing today in other circumstances, have put together. Um, so we are members of a working group convened by the WHO on ethics and governance of the COVID-19 response. And um, a representative of the WHO SAGE panel uh, made a presentation to us where uh, he explained the current scientific thinking and the guidelines produced on the basis of evidence-based medicine for use of the vaccines. And as we've heard, uh, there was at that time some reason to space out AstraZeneca, um, but there had been no clinical trials showing um, that this was a scientifically based policy for Moderna or Pfizer vaccines. Um, my country, the UK, had already departed from the WHO guidelines in that we were spacing out. At that time, we only had Pfizer um, as well as AstraZeneca. So there was a question, were we in the UK already violating the ethical guidance by not following the uh, evidence-based science? Or conversely, would it have been unethical to follow the science in this case because the um, epidemic was raging very strongly, the hundreds if not thousands of people dying every day, the hospitals were not yet overwhelmed, but it could be. And so there was a clamor to say, what and we need to do whatever we can in our power to bring the epidemic under control as soon as possible. And some other countries had that same attitude. And so there was a real question about whether it's ethically right to delay the second dose so that you can have more people immunized immediately. Now, what we thought was that um, there are certainly ethical and policy considerations, not just ethical considerations, but ethical and policy considerations, in addition to the evidence-based science recommendations we have from clinical trials and other sources. So we were 
had the question put to us, what type of ethical and policy guidelines could we put together? Well, in our personal capacity, rather than our, in our capacity as members of the working group, we have produced a paper uh, that is now forthcoming in BMJ Global Health. And what we've done is to acknowledge that circumstances differ. So for example, if you're in a country with a low level of infection, it may be wrong to depart from the science. But if you're in a country where your hospitals are overwhelmed and your um, you don't have a large supply of vaccine, you may want to consider other options. We don't, in the paper, tell you what to do. What we tell you is what to take into account when you're making your decision. So rather than run through everything, I'll, I'll just say rather quickly the sorts of considerations that we think ought to be taken into account. So we think, obviously, you need to evaluate the risks of the alternative modality you're considering and compare it with the standard modality. So what are the risks? Well, what immunity will it confer in terms of length and strength? Will there be more adverse effects? What is more likely to lead to variants of concern? What are the economic and social consequences? And we need to consider this for the individual and for the community and for the global community, particularly around variants of concern. Beyond that, there are other considerations, ethical and practical considerations. For example, whether the alternative modality will invalidate vaccine indemnity, or whether changing the modality will lead to a loss of confidence in public health authorities. There are issues of consent and the legitimate expectations of people who've received one dose. Issues about consultation, that there should be broad consultation with health groups, medical bodies, faith groups, and so on. Whatever the policy is, it should be widely communicated and also the reasons for it. Critically important though, is that every, anything done should be kept under surveillance and should involve active research. And the results of that research should be communicated not just to you know within your country but to the international community very important that the implementation of any modality doesn't breach principles of equity by for example increasing risks to disadvantaged populations and minorities but we have an important caveat which is that policy considerations are not reasons for ignoring the science of course the scientific evidence should be at the forefront of everyone's mind, every policymaker's mind. In addition to clinical trials, observational studies, any other sources of evidence should be scrutinized. If there's cause for concern, there's reason to change policy course. And um, you should equally contribute to the international discussion. This could be more problematic for countries with low resources, but nevertheless, if you're deviating from the recommended modalities, you have an obligation to understand, research and communicate what is happening. And as I say, to change course when needed. So in conclusion, we'd say there's no fixed and easy formula for balancing these and other factors. We're not going to say you should do this, you shouldn't do this, but what we are going to say is that if you attempt an alternative modality without considering all of these considerations, then there's a sense in which you've been negligent. All of these considerations need to be part of a complex process of deliberation. So um, I'd be very interested to hear your feedback. I think this is one of those many areas where anyone who thinks has an easy answer hasn't seen the whole of the problem. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I couldn't uh, agree with you more on that last sentiment. Uh, Cassandra, I understand you have some slides, so I will turn it over to you. And thank you to uh, Raji and Joe for their excellent discussions thus far. Okay, so I'm going to come at this from a different perspective um, today because it's just too interesting what's happening here in the Regina, Saskatchewan, Canada area. And my area of research focus is First Nations and Métis communities here in Canada. So 
In terms of what we were expecting from Indigenous communities and First Nations specifically in Canada when it came to their response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we were predicting several things. We thought that the colonial history here in Canada combined with government mistrust would lead to a lot of vaccine hesitancy. We thought that there would be higher rates of infection and death. We expected numerous outbreaks within a community. We were looking for transmission between on-reserve and off-reserve members. So First Nations folks who are living in First Nations communities but travel back and forth or or reside back and forth in urban centers. And we were expecting quite a bit of fear mongering and pushback. And just for time's sake today, um, I won't go into too much the colonial history and government mistrust of uh, um, vaccines and medical experimentation here in Canada with the indigenous population. But if you're interested in learning more, there's a wonderful book there that you can check out called The Determinants of Indigenous People's Health. But in Canada, there was at various points um, government led medical experiments on indigenous people related to nutrition, um, and related to our residential school policy where First Nations were forcefully removed from their communities and put into residential schools where they were physically, sexually, mentally, and emotionally abused. So this is what we were expecting and, and what a lot of researchers thought would happen in terms of First Nations people in the pandemic. And we were kind of expecting the worst. But what actually happened and what is still happening is very interesting. Um, so I was just on a phone call the other day. Let's close that. And um, with Dr. Ibrahim Khan, the Chief Me Medical Officer for Indigenous Services Canada in our local region. And he said, quote, First Nations are actually crushing COVID-19 in this area and in, and in a general trend across Canada. We're seeing high rates of vaccinations. Everyone who is able to get vaccinated appears to be lining up to be vaccinated. So we're not seeing the hesitancy we expected. We've actually seen an expanded delivery of vaccinations. So First Nations communities in comparison to urban centers that are non-Indigenous here in Canada um, are already vaccinating at lower ages. They have expanded their vaccination schedule beyond Indigenous or First Nations people to target groups like police officers, which actually haven't been identified as first responders here. And they're delivering vaccinations now to non-Indigenous people. So not only do we have what we thought was gonna be one of our most vulnerable populations um, ahead of the game when it comes to containing COVID. We also have them actually assisting the advantaged population of non-Indigenous people in urban centers. We're seeing very low rates of vaccine hesitancy. And if we actually looked closer at the data, history told us that this was possible because Indigenous people actually do have, when it's available and accessible to them, a very um, good uptake of accepting vaccinations. Now, interestingly, and this is still being looked at, but this is what some of the preliminary information suggests. How is this happening? So travel restrictions, First Nations communities, unlike other provinces or urban centers in Canada, strictly monitored traffic in and out of their communities. They took advantage of remote learning early on and actually distributed devices to children in their communities, iPads, other kinds of tablets, laptops, and provided supports for children to continue learning. They did vaccine delivery in their communities, locally administered. They actually called citizens um, and engaged them and reached out to them to make sure that no one was left behind. More importantly, perhaps they've provided a lot of social supports. So in addition to the actual vaccines themselves and regularly communicating with their citizens via social media or calling, they have also upgraded internet for their citizens to ensure that people have access to timely information and that um, children are able to do remote learning to encourage families to stay at home. 
They've distributed family activity packages. They have also done social media engagement to engage with their citizens um, and ensure that people don't feel isolated. In terms of health supports, they've done sanitizing kits, <clears throat> which were delivered to individual households. They've provided weekly and monthly food baskets, and they've gone so far as doing water delivery for seniors and housebound citizens because many First Nations communities in Canada live under boil water advisories or only have access, in other words, to water that is not safe for drinking. So interestingly enough, one of the most vulnerable populations in Canada, First Nations people, have actually taken it upon themselves to exceed the standards put forward by provincial and federal guidelines. And so far, it's appeared to have worked. And a, a quick little mini case study to sort of show the comparisons of what's happening right now. So in Regina, Saskatchewan, which is about 45 minutes away from several First Nations communities, for the sake of their privacy, I'm just gonna call them Community X here. But in Regina, Saskatchewan, we have an outbreak of the, var of the COVID variants and our ICUs are over capacity. The vaccines are only available to our older age group subject to availability. And in fact, we have actually had a shortage of vaccines in this urban area recently and the drive through vaccination clinics have actually shut down for periods at a time due to a lack of vaccines. There's an alert to avoid the city. So if you're going to drive into Regina or travel into the area, they actually have signs up, but it's non-monitored for the most part. So traffic and um, people are free to come and go as they choose. Social supports are being delivered by the federal government and nonprofit agencies, but we really don't see the province taking a big role in terms of providing social or additional health supports. And right now, school divisions in this city are remote delivery only. Now you can contrast that with several First Nations communities that are only about a 45 minute drive away where many have zero active cases. They still have those social supports in place. They still have the health supports in place. They're still even providing um, water delivery or good food basket delivery to folks so that they don't have to leave their homes or go in and out of the community more than is necessary. Borders were actually once restricted to citizens, but they're now open and just monitored. And schools are open with remote options available. So it's a world of difference 45 minutes away from an urban center where they have followed very minimal, I would say, provincial guidelines versus First Nations communities where we did not expect this kind of robust response. And interestingly, and this is where I'll wrap it up, but this is the part that I find most interesting um, as a policy scholar, what are some of the values that have underpinned First Nations decision making that were different than the rest of the federal and provincial government here in Canada? There's definitely a value and an understanding in our Indigenous communities of community beyond the individual. So family ties, relationality and relationships are important, which meant that this understanding of what a community needs to do to come together um, is already embedded in many Indigenous communities. There is a very clear value of life and a very clear value of health. These are things that are talked about and discussed. The importance of our knowledge keepers or our seniors and our most vulnerable, those are considered essentially the highest members of our community. And we know that they were some of the most vulnerable to COVID. So a lot of messaging was done around your actions have the ability to save the life of a knowledge keeper, a senior or someone vulnerable in your community. Finally, and this one's quite interesting, economy. First Nations communities are in such remote areas um, and specifically put there by government policy that in many cases, the economy is non-existent. And so it's not a factor. So while we see the provincial and federal governments balancing individual freedoms and economic priorities against a public health response, we don't see those things competing as much in Indigenous communities that are already vulnerable, marginalized, and poor, don't have grocery stores, 
don't have their own economy happening in the community. And so the value of public health rises quite quickly to the top in those scenarios. More interestingly, this can be summed up as we see the Canadian federal and provincial governments developing policy constantly in response to a problem. And we know as policy scholars, that's usually where policy responses come from. They are designed to address a problem of the public interest. What First Nations did was the reverse. They set a goal and used a policy construction model. And their goal was, we want to have zero cases and zero deaths. And they worked backwards from that versus here's a COVID-19 pandemic. What are we going to do to try to control and contain? So it's been a really interesting um, process watching this play out here in Canada from an Indigenous perspective and um, let alone some of the things that we're going to talk about today. So I'll leave it there. Uh, thank you, Cassandra, for a, a very fascinating and insightful uh, presentation. So uh, before we open, I'm going to remind participants uh, on this webinar to put their questions for the panelists in the question and answer, and I'll turn to those very shortly. Uh, but would any of the panelists like to reflect upon or comment on any of the presentations that they've uh, heard from their fellow co-panelists? Joe, please go ahead. Well, um, it, it's just so interesting to hear both of the uh, co-panelists and, and their perspective. And uh, Cassandra, this is really eye-opening the way in which you describe the two different approaches to policy. Um, I, I, I wonder if you see that elsewhere. So do you think New Zealand had that same strategy with the idea that you know, we start from the idea thought we're going to preserve health and life and we fit everything around that rather than trying to balance different considerations? It's a good question. Um, and I mean, it's possible with New Zealand. What I can speak to specifically is that, and this is what my PhD research is around, this tends to be across the board, the Indigenous approach to policymaking. It's much more constructive and goal oriented. And it typically starts with community values that are well understood by the community. And so over time, it's almost more like policy refinement versus starting from that problem and being much more reactionary. And when it comes to COVID, there are some special considerations, like I said, about that lack of economy already existing. It, it's almost comical from a First Nations perspective in these isolated remote communities to hear how much other governments in Canada are focusing on, well, what about economic prosperity? How do we balance it? And communities are saying, what are you talking about? We already have none of that, let's preserve health. So there's a lot of factors at play, but I do see across the board that indigenous communities in Canada tend to make policy like this. Um, and I've seen it in our American indigenous brothers and sisters as well. So it's it's emerging and it's an understudied area, but it's fascinating from a policy perspective, very different approach. Thank you, Cassandra. Uh, Raji, do you have any questions or input for your panelists or Cassandra? Raji, go ahead, please. Uh, no, I think for me, it's more of a comment rather than a question for um, Cassandra, because she was uh, going through those um, slides. What really um, or readily comes to mind is that uh, we see similar situation in um, Africa, especially um, in the rural um, areas. And of course, there are a lot of um, reasons um, to that why, I mean, the, the, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, devastating when you go to um, our community. Um, the reasons, for instance, these are coming that are not I mean, as connected as remaining part of um, the, the, the world or the, 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 the major um, cities. Because when you look at the epidemiology of the COVID-19 in, uh, in Africa, you discover that um, we have uh, much more cases in our uh, capital cities than the um, rural um, areas. And um, of course, um, the as I mentioned, the reason is quite um, obvious. So what I could see from what Cassandra uh, presented is um, a lot of similarities between the, 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 the indigenous uh, people in um, Canada and the rural um, setting in um, Africa. Over. 
Thank you, Raji. Any other last comments from our uh, panelists before I turn to some of the questions that have been raised? So one of the uh, themes in the questions, and there's clearly quite a lot of interest, uh, Cassandra, in how uh, in, in the process by which uh, Indigenous values have informed the process, uh, but sort of turning to our, our uh, and maybe we can come back to that shortly, uh, but one of the issues that's been raised in the questions is about uh, who's accountable for uh, the uh, consequences of the decisions of deviating from uh, the evidence. Um, I'm going to set aside the questions that have been raised about uh, variants and the effectiveness of vaccines on variants, unless one of our panelists has a uh, uh, particular knowledge on that, because I'm not sure that we're all uh, uh, experts on uh, uh, on the efficacy of the vaccines. Uh, Raji, you might have some uh, comment there, but who takes responsibility and how is accountability assured for when we move away from the established modalities, arguably uh, as we move further away from uh, trial results, the robustness of the evidence becomes uh, diminished. Does anybody want, I'm, uh, uh, Raji, you have your microphone off, so I'll go to you first. All right, no, thank you, thank you. So uh, looking at variant um, of concern and um, the efficacy of the different um, vaccines, of course, we know that um, for now in um, Africa, the most prevalent um, variants of concern in the South Africa are variant. And uh, what we know as of um, today is that um, the AstraZeneca COVID-19 vaccine is not effective against that particular um, variant. So uh, this explains why um, South Africa had to abandon that. So what works for that particular variant for now is Johnson & Johnson. And I think efficacy of close to 62% um, um, has been um, demonstrated in um, a limited um, trial that was um, carried out in um, South Africa. Over. Uh, you are muted. Yeah, I think you need to unmute yourself, Rose. I, I, I ended my streak of not being asked to be unmuted, uh, but thanks, Raji. Uh, anybody want to take a, a crack at the accountability issue? Um, uh, Cassandra, I'd be interested, and in, we've seen uh, some questions about how decision making and values are uh, taking place in uh, Indigenous communities. Uh, but imagine a situation, so just for clarity, has everybody gotten both doses or have you had a discussion uh, around uh, altering or, or shifting around the dosage schedule in your communities? It's a good question. Um, it differs depending on the community. I think most of them have first dosage and then decided along the lines of what we discussed today that it's in the best interest of all given that the first dosage already has quite a bit of coverage and protection for them to expand it to the larger community, which is very interesting because as I've said, they've gone beyond indigenous communities and are actually sharing their vaccine supply with non-indigenous folks. So there doesn't seem to be a lot of fear about will we have enough to do the second dose when it's ready. Um, so it seems like so far they are going with the approach of let's try to vaccinate as many folks as we can with the first dose. There will be a second dose coming at some point and they're trusting the evidence so far. I will say that I think a big part of their success with that has been being, and this falls in line with the accountability, um, that the chief medical health officers that are relevant to them and the health leaders in their communities and the political leaders are being very transparent and are always sharing information. And so I think that there is a sense of, as we've talked about here, and as was provided in the briefing to us, policy needs to change and adjust as we move. And this is such a living, breathing thing that we're dealing with here, um, that we're trying to develop policy on the spot as we go. I think for a lot of indigenous communities, because it's been transparent from the beginning and there's a healthy level of skepticism when it comes to health already, that people are not maybe as caught off guard by that. And with the transparency of their community leaders has come some increased trust. So I think that the sharing of the information has been really important to um, them trusting the direction they're being provided by their, by their leaders. Thank you. Uh, Joe, I saw your hand to raise. Uh, that's right. I mean, so the, 
these issues of accountability are so important, and it's not only around alternative modalities, but things like ordering lockdowns, closing schools, you know, a whole load of um, very unpopular decisions or immediately unpopular decisions have to be made. And um, in, in some countries, you, you see a rather slippery type of leadership. So they can position, leaders can position themselves to take credit if things go well and to not take the blame if it goes badly. And so th saying things like following the science is one way in which they enter the sort of zone of ambiguity. Because as we know, there is not one scientific opinion on many, many factors. So I, th so I think um, one thing that occurred to me early on in the pandemic is that it, it was too early to know which countries are going to end up most successful or least successful, um, you know, because all the policies were experimental, and many of the policies were experimental. But it was um, it wasn't too hard to know which countries were being well led and which countries were being badly led. And which in which countries the leaders were gaining the respect of the people and the leaders were losing the respect of the people. The accountability will have a long, long-term effect. But I, I think you know, like, like any political decision, it has to be ultimately the politicians guided by the science and guided by advisors rather than saying they're delegating the decisions to the to the scientists, because the scientists only know one side of a very complicated picture. Thanks. Uh, Raj or Cassandra, any further reflections on that point? Cassandra? Yeah. Um, what I, building on that, what I think has been really dangerous to public trust and shows a challenge of accountability is when you have the medical community and the science community and chief public health officers suggesting one path and political leaders suggesting another. And I think that is where this issue of accountability has done, ha, has really shown itself and presented a challenge for, for the public and the public trust. Um, in Saskatchewan, here in Canada, we saw it was, it was clear as night and day, similar to the United States under the Trump administration in terms of what our public health officials are, are saying through gritted teeth. Um, and you can see the alarm bells going off of how much they feel like we need to have restrictions, this needs to be taken more seriously, we need to have limitations. And then what we see our political leaders saying, because they're really balancing that against maintaining their political base. I think we rarely see that in many areas of public policy where you see your experts publicly and your political leadership differing on opinions. And how that has played out here when the stakes are so high, I find incredibly irresponsible um, and really dangerous for our communities and the public trust and, and, and how we're supposed to perceive that information. Uh, Raji, you've unmuted yourself. Would you yeah, like yeah, to chime no, in? Th th thank you, Rose. I think just to, I mean, um, uh, to compliment what um, Cassandra and uh, my other colleague has um, talked about the, 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 the using the political um, platform to, 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 I mean, leverage on the political platform, you know, to, to make sure that uh, we're able to use um, science and data to inform our policy and practice as far as COVID-19 pandemic is um, concern. When you look at the Africa CDC, this is a specialized technical institution that is housed within um, a political um, organization, that's the um, African Union. So because of that unique um, position of um, Africa CDC, I think we're able to rally our political support for most of our strategy, our initiative, and our programs as far as responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. And this has allowed um, some sort of um, significant coordination, collaboration, and cooperation between between the different um, member states. For instance, if you look at um, the, 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 the response to the COVID-19 pandemic right from um, outset, the ministers were able to come together and agree on a common um, strategy. They were able to come together, agree on a tax force that would drive 
the implementation of that um, um, strategy. And looking at the, the, the COVID-19 vaccine and other medical supplies on its own, we know that these were issues right from the outset of this COVID-19 um, pandemic. And as Africa CDC, we knew that something like this will happen. The issue of equitable access to most of these supplies and, um, and um, other intervention like um, the uh, vaccines. So we're able to use the, 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 the platform provided by our head of state and the government who actually oversee the day-to-day -day activities of the um, African Union to ensure that they're able to talk to their counterparts in, um, in um, Asia, in um, other uh, developed um, countries to make sure that uh, we are able to have that equitable access to most of these um, supplies through um, a sort of um, a digital uh, platform that was uh, put um, in place. So I, I think um, uh, whether we like it or not, as I mentioned during the course of my presentation, that responding to this COVID-19 pandemic will require all hands on deck. And it also requires us to speak with one voice. Because when the politicians are singing different tone, as scientists, we are singing different um, tone, I think this is not going to help in them anyway. Let me stop there. Over to you, Rose. Thank you. So one question that's uh, arisen, uh, particularly in jurisdictions that have extended the doses, uh, as mentioned. So uh, there's a difference between being, say, 60%, uh, we'll just use out of a, a, a protected with one dose, as opposed to being 90% protected with two doses. So individuals who have uh, been told that after they got their first dose, they're gonna to have to wait later for their second dose, have actually been put at a, a, a measurable risk. So to what extent is any deviation? So these uh, vaccines are still under emergency authorization. Um, so to what extent is any deviation from uh, the clinical trials to be considered uh, research in and of itself? And what sort of consent is required from people receiving or uh, foregoing their uh, second dose? And what are the obligations to, um, so the first question is, what are the obligations? Is it, should they be consented to this? Second question is, what are the obligations of uh, uh, policymakers who are making this decision? And thirdly, not every uh, jurisdiction has uh, gone down this pathway. So as we have this heterogeneous patchwork of uh, policies uh, globally, what are the ethical implications of that? Does anybody want to take a stab at any of those questions? So maybe Joe, I'll go ahead, please. I'll, I'll take a stab at the third one. So, so I find this a fascinating idea that um, you know if, if there are different policies in different countries or in different states within the same country, that th this is going to the suggestion is will it undermine faith in the decision makers? And I, it, it's a question really about the sophistication of the public. So I think if the public are aware as they are aware that we're in a situation where um, evidence is not conclusive, there's room for reasonable disagreements. There could be an argument that experimenting with different approaches and learning from each other by doing different things is actually better for public health overall than everyone following one policy, which may turn out not to be the optimum policy. So al although I think you know, there is a danger that diverse policies could lead to a lack of mistrust, if people are sophisticated enough, I, I don't think it, it needs to, and it could actually be be welcome. Thanks, uh, Raji. Do you want to follow up on that? Yeah, no. Uh, thank you, thank, 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 thank you, um, Rose, and uh, thank you, Jonathan, for for, for that. So I, I think um, uh, whatever policy should be informed by evidence, should be informed by science, should be informed by, by data. I agree that um, these uh, vaccines are still under emergency use um, authorization, meaning that uh, we still need uh, more and more um, um, uh, data. But we should know one thing that um, even before these vaccines were rolled out, the rate of hesitancy, you know, it's um, really, really quite um, high in most of our member states. And uh, you, we wouldn't want to do anything that will further drive that vaccine um, hesitancy upwards again. So whatever we need to do should be informed by science and um, uh, data. Because for now, the evidence here is that, um, I mean, the dose we, we know, um, the interval is known. For the vaccine, what interval can be prolonged based on 
inadvertent sort of, um, I mean, they find it during the course of clinical trial, we know. So I, I think for us, as much as possible, let's stick toward the science and um, I mean, whatever policy or practice that are out there should be informed by um, science and um, data, over. Thank you. Joe, did you wanna jump in again? Just very briefly, because I, I, I completely agree, Raji, but I would, I would just want to force the distinction between being informed by science and being determined by science. Um, because you know, there are two types of uncertainty here. One is just un scientific uncertainty, that um, you know, all our conclusions are provisional at the moment, so we, we still have to find out more. And you know, there are other considerations to take into account around policy. But where I absolutely completely agree with you, that where there is negative scientific evidence, then we should treat that very, very seriously. So if something is known to be harmful, that's a very strong reason for not doing it. But if we're only going to follow you know, the conclusive evidence, you know, we'd still be waiting for the clinical trials to finish. Yeah, so we, you know, we have taken risks with the evidence that you know, the, the vaccines, as you say, are under emergency use authorization. They're not under full level of authorization that other vaccines have gone through. So, we, so we're still in a position where we, we don't have that absolute certainty, or we would ever have absolute certainty. Yes, and uh, having been a physician researcher for 30 years, I'm unaware of a situation in clinical or public health medicine where we've had anything close to 100% certainty. So there's a, a lot of questions in the uh, Q&A uh, that uh, I'd like to get to, and I hope uh, that we could, we'll have access to them because Cassandra, there's a lot of uh, questions directed to you about the scalability uh, of the approach that you've taken uh, to other jurisdictions, and maybe we can reserve uh, a, a moment for that. But there was an interesting question about whether people who have been recovered from COVID uh, illness uh, should receive vaccine before uh, people who have not had uh, an opportunity to be vaccinated. And that seems like kind of a, a, a tractable question to address. And then I'll, I'll turn to Cassandra for some reflections on scaling up the approach that uh, uh, she described for us. Does anybody want to uh, handle the uh, whether you should uh, vaccinate some Somebody who's been uh, recovered from uh, uh, COVID-19 before uh, others. Joe, I see you. <laughs> you want to jump in there? Sorry to dominate, but I did. I sneaked uh, this question in the chat. I sneaked a peek at it, and I thought, what an interesting question. And and what I feel is that this may be one of those areas where ethics and policy come apart, because I think you know, ethically it may well be not right to vaccinate someone who's recovered on the assumption they have. A significant level of antibodies. But it, that would be such a difficult rule to implement in many cases. And that, you know, people would perhaps falsify their health record in order to get to the vaccine and so on. So in policy terms, it might just be too complicated. So, so I think there are many times in life where the ethically ideal is just not practical to do. And you need to follow a simple rule with rough justice rather than having perfect justice. Yes, thank you very much, Joe. So we're getting close to time and there were a series of questions in the Q&A uh, uh, for Cassandra. Uh, one uh, from uh, Prakash in Nepal asking for uh, three uh, key uh, policy lessons that, uh, that you've learned that might be adaptable to their con uh, context. And also uh, a con uh, question from Belgium uh, saying that uh, they seem to have the same values, but they've uh, uh, had a very different experience and whether uh, the isolated nature of some of the communities may have actually uh, worked in the favor of the response. Uh, we all know that vaccines are probably not the complete and total answer to bringing the uh, uh, pandemic to an end and some of the sort of policy and uh, community uh, uh, interventions that you outlined may be uh, helpful ways of going forward. So. So uh, Cassandra, over to you if you'd like to take those questions. Yeah, first to just um, add to what Jonathan and Raji were saying, it, it really, it, it's funny. I think from a policy perspective, this is what policy looks like behind the scenes all the time. 
your technical scientific folks trying to give all the best advice that's emerging and changing all the time and filtering that up to our political leaders and then maybe taking about 5% of it. Um, I think that that's what happens with public policy all the time. We're a very blunt instrument. We're not refined, we're, it's not designed to be that way. When um, Jonathan was talking about, I think it depends sort of on the sophistication of the, of the citizens. If anything, for me, this pandemic has blown open um, our lack of understanding around the policy process, how much we make policy behind closed doors that our citizens are not raised to understand or feel informed about. And so I don't even think we were properly prepared as citizens, pandemic or not, to have the curtain pulled back on the really messy way that public policy is made. And it's almost comical because um, we don't want to show that there is no science behind how we do public decision making. There is no refined one model that works everywhere. So it, it's really not surprising that we all have to take different approaches depending on context and depending on information. When it comes to the Indigenous response, back to sort of the three values question or a couple of values that are applicable that you can take to other contexts and we're just starting to work on some research now this is what my dissertation looks at um, because it's very understudied but one is being having policy embedded in community values and that's not necessarily the same as having public policy be directed by whichever party won most of the popular vote and is in charge so that's different community values are different and not necessarily the same as um, the political leadership values. So community values and being embedded in community and having a really good sense of what those are. Two, definitely um, that trust factor with your leadership. I think that's been really critical and important. But then three, the value of health as a value in and of itself. Um, and beyond healthcare, beyond health services, teaching people the value of that health. And it is really embedded in indigenous communities to understand what that means. Someone had mentioned, does the rural and remoteness of these indigenous communities become a relevant factor? It absolutely does because they can control the traffic of who comes in and out of a community more so than a larger urban center. But what's interesting there is the openness of their citizenship to accepting that and adhering to that versus what I would say is a lot of resistance from non-Indigenous communities and urban center to accepting limits on their individual freedoms. So there's a big difference I would say that's relevant that can be replicated in terms of Indigenous communities understanding community values and that sense of relationship and relationality to one another versus what we put on in non-Indigenous communities, the value of individual freedoms. So a couple of, couple of values. And there really isn't a lot of research in this area. So it really is difficult to find because when it comes to Indigenous health, people tend to look at um, culture, there's Indigenous culture, and people tend to look at Indigenous laws. But we know even in non-Indigenous society, policy covers about 99.9% .9 of everything else. So those are actually only two small parts of it. Um, so more research is coming, but it's, it's highly under-researched. Thank you, Cassandra. So we're at uh, close to time. Um, so I'm just going to ask uh, Joe or Ra at, and Raji to give uh, maybe a 15 second last word. We've peeled, we've started to peel apart the onion and a very complex onion it isn't today, today that we were dealing with. Joe, uh, last words. Thank you. Um, just to thank the participants. And um, I, I suppose my one message is that we've got three different things. One is science, another is ethics, and another is policy. And it's very good when they all are aligned, but they aren't necessarily aligned in every case. And then we have the really hard decisions to make. Thank you. Raji, last word. Um, well, thank you, thank you. Let me join um, Joe to thank uh, the participants and the organizers of this very, very important and timely uh, meeting. And I think I will still uh, go back to my um, opening um, statement that um, as far as this um, terrain of um, 
ethics, policy, and science is um, concerned, as much as possible, any alteration to um, the, 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 the currently available um, strategy as far as really now the COVID-19 vaccine is concerned should be guided by um, science and um, data. And uh, because already we have a very high level of vaccine um, hesitancy and we will not want to do anything that will further um, raise that particular um, bar. Uh, thank you, over to you, Rose. Okay, and Cassandra, you answered a question, so I should give you actually the last word as well. Just, you know, I think, um, and it's come, it's apparent in this discussion, there are many ways to try to braid those three things together that Jonathan mentioned. Um, and I think that it isn't necessarily a negative that countries and states are taking different approaches because it's highly contextual how you balance those three things at any given time. And it is important to be mindful that there are alternatives and we could be doing some policy learning looking from one another. So um, yeah, and, and like I said, policy is a blunt instrument. It's not a fine one. So watching this play out in real time is, is um, scary and eye-opening, even as someone who looks at policy all the time, so. Well, thank you, Cassandra. I think that's a, a, a wonderful sentiment, sentiment to conclude. We cannot uh, go forward unless we're willing and open to learn from each other. And the best way to learn from each other is to have uh, discussions such as this, which was remarkably insightful and stimulating. Uh, so on behalf of Epidemic Ethics, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Raji, Joe, and uh, Cassandra for a fabulous discussion. And to remind participants that this has been recorded and will be up soon on the Epidemic Ethics website. And please do keep check on the uh, website because there will be more uh, fascinating uh, webinars in the near future. And hopefully we can pick up some of the themes uh, that were discussed today and go into them in greater depth. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for attending. And I wish you all uh, the best. Uh, please be healthy, be safe and be sane and be most of all be kind to each other. Uh, thank you for your attention and time today. Bye bye.